If you've been watching my series lately, you are aware that I am addressing some of the accusations that many theists and non-physicalists have laid against materialism. In this video, I will be addressing the so-called hard problem of consciousness laid out by philosopher David Chalmers. The hard problem contrasts with the so-called easy problems that pertain to awareness, information, integration, intentionality, and the categorization of various percepts. The hard problem pertains to how we have subjective sensations like taste, color, and sound. The hard problem pertains specifically to the notion of how a physical system can give rise to subjective experience. One of the many issues that arise in addressing the hard problem of consciousness is a lack of a coherent definition of consciousness. I personally hold that there cannot be a coherent definition of consciousness because it is not one thing. We need to break it down into its various components in order to really properly understand it. Here's Marvin Minsky's take on the word. You have called consciousness a suitcase word. What do you mean by that? Well, I think the word consciousness is a clever trick that we use to keep from thinking about how thinking works. And what we do is we take a lot of different phenomena and we give them all the same name and then you think you've got it. It's just so, so packing a lot of separate stuff into a suitcase. Yes, <laughs> because if you look in a dictionary, you'll find things which descriptions saying a person is aware of themselves or something like that. But what does it mean to say you're aware of yourself? And if you think in terms of the brain as a whole bunch of uh, different kinds of machinery with various connections, then it it's easy to see that it would be very hard for any one part of the brain to know what's happening in all the rest. There's just too much. So in fact, each part of the brain has connections to some other parts of the brain and can get some idea, but there's no place that knows everything. It seems to me that when we people talk about consciousness, they're talking about at least four or five major things and dozens of others. For example, if you ask, were you conscious that you touched your ear? You might say no. I didn't know I did that. You might say yes. If you say yes, it's because uh, some part of your mind, the part that talks, has access to something that remembers uh, what's happened recently with your arm and your ear. The reason you can say that is that you've made some sort of representation of the recent past. I think it's a very strange idea that there's some wonderful property of the brain that can do so many different things, uh, such as to remember what you've been doing recently or uh, remember who you are and, uh, and why you're able to talk about yourself and just so many things like that. We use the word conscious for uh, example when you know why you did something. Sometimes you just do something without even remembering that you did it or knowing a reason. We love the idea that some things are done deliberately and some things are done automatically because that that's convenient for legal and ethical and other operations. So the word conscious is very valuable socially. It's all right to punish someone if they know what they did and perhaps why because because what? Because they might be able to learn. If they have a representation of what caused that, then they might be able to change it. And so uh, the idea of punishment or reward is valuable for things that people were, quote, aware of. But there are hundreds of kinds of awareness. There's remembering something as an image. There's remembering something as a string of words. There's remembering the tactile feeling of something. When a word has multiple meanings, that ambiguity is often very valuable. But if you're trying to understand those processes and you've put them all in one box, then you say, where in the brain is consciousness located? There's a whole society of scientists who are trying to find the, the place in the brain where consciousness is. But if it's a suitcase and it's just a word for many different processes, they're wasting their time. Minsky's idea is that consciousness is not just a unifying phenomenon. It's the sum of various interrelated processes in the brain. In fact, we need to come to grips with the fact that consciousness is not something that takes place in one single central processing unit. 
of the brain, as this brings back the notion of a soul or a homunculus or some sort of intrinsic persistent self that receives the sense data. This notion, however, must be abandoned. One of the arguments put forth as a defeater for materialism is the knowledge argument by the philosopher Frank Jackson. The argument goes as follows. Mary is a brilliant scientist who studied light, optics, color, and neuroscience, and knows everything there is to know about the neurophysiology of color perception. However, Mary has never experienced seeing color because she lives in a black and white cell. Jackson argues that upon being released from her cell, Mary will know what it is like to have seen color, but this knowledge only exists in her experience. In other words, the phenomenology of Mary seeing color is irreducible to physical facts, and thus there must be facts that are not physical. If you argue that Mary does gain knowledge, then you believe that there are some facts that are not physical. And this is a problem for materialism. Well, I have two responses to this argument. The first is that the thought experiment is malformed, and the second one is that Mary does not gain any form of propositional knowledge even if the thought experiment were coherent. The reason the thought experiment is malformed is because Mary could not know what color even was while she was in her cell. She would only know about wavelengths that interact with the brain, go through the visual cortices, and are received as percepts. She would not know, however, how the brain processed them. If you saw the third part of my series on materialism, you saw the fact that the Himba tribe of northern Namibia cannot distinguish green and blue because they see colors differently based on their language. Green and blue have the same word associated with them. In what sense would Mary be able to know what colors look like if they are necessarily relative to each person due to their mental states, mood, language, memory, and other factors? To drive the point home, we know that sharks have a sensorial ability known as electroreception that allows them to detect tiny little electrical fields generated by organisms in their environment every time they move their muscles. We cannot know how the shark subjectively experiences a nearby school of fish as opposed to the electric fields produced by a surfer in the water. Remember, color is just a label we give to how the mind processes different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation. The only reason the word color exists is because we experience it and we know what causes it. However, we do not experience electroreception and electric fields that result from it in the same way that the shark does, and thus we do not have a word for it. Mary would have to acquire knowledge of how to see color and how to make the distinctions and associations between different colors in order to gain any sort of subjective experience associated with them. An experiment similar to Mary's room was actually done on a pair of squirrel monkeys named Sam and Dalton. Here's a clip from BBC Horizons documentary, Do You See What I See, explaining this experiment. Meet Dalton. Meet Sam. They are squirrel monkeys that Jay has been working with for the last four years. Like all squirrel monkeys, when they arrived at Jay's lab, they were colorblind and couldn't see reds or greens. The squirrel monkeys have red-green color blindness. So the thing that red-green color blindness means is that these animals that have that, and humans too, they l completely lack the sensations of either red or green. The good, big question was, does this change the way that the brain interprets the signals from the eye and so that they would actually have an experience of color vision that would be like what a human would. His team did something remarkable to these monkeys. They gave them the missing receptors in their eyes and allowed them to see the reds and greens which had been invisible. He wanted to find out whether having these new cones in their eyes would allow them to see new colors. All of a sudden, they were able to pick out those red dots and green dots against the gray background. 
probably the thing that amazed us the most, besides the fact that it worked at all, is that it seemed like that they were able to get this new color sensation immediately as soon as the new thing turned on. So somehow the brain was able to make some kind of sense out of this immediately. With their new sense of red-green color vision, Sam and Dalton could, for the first time, point to the green and red dots on the screen. And crucially, when it came to feeding time, they were able to associate colors with different colored food. And so over time, they learned to associate different colors with different objects, and now they kind of take on the lives of themselves, so they say, oh, this is a food I like, so I like red. But this is the key to how colors became connected to emotions. If the monkeys like red fruit, then they learnt to associate the color red more generally with pleasure. And what that means for our sense of color is that the earliest colors we learnt, blue and yellow, have hardwired emotional connections. Our associations with red and green, we've had to learn. So I think that maybe red-green color vision is very different than blue-yellow color vision that's so deep inside of us that those emotions are driven by something that we were born with. The fact that the blues are kind of calming. And that's why that people make such a strong distinction between cool colors and warm colors as opposed to red and green. Just like the squirrel monkeys, Mary would have to build concepts on these unexampled hues in order for them to have any sort of meaning or intentionality. Mary, however, possesses something at her disposal that the squirrel monkeys do not possess, at least not to any significantly high degree. Language. Words are the most efficient methods of information storage that the human brain possesses to date. For the squirrel monkeys, the subjective ex distinction was primarily event-based as they would associate colors with a different food that they would either like or dislike. But their awareness of those distinctions was not as rich because their brains are less advanced than ours. They don't know that they're seeing red because they don't linguistically categorize it as red. They don't have a proposition to attach to it. So there is no truth value of the matter to them as to what they're experiencing. We have propositionalized our phenomenology, and that can be the source of many, many problems in regards to the hard problem of consciousness. And I'll actually return to this point later. However, in humans, we have discrete units of meaning that we attach to objects of our experience that embed themselves in our brain better than anything else. And as demonstrated with the example with the himba, the way we assign meaning to objects of our experience can radically wire our phenomenology. And I'll also be returning to this point later. Another argument that non-physicalists point to in order to say that there is something mysterious about consciousness is the fact that subjective experience is apparently immediate. The hard problem of consciousness is not addressed by evolution as it fails to explain how things like qualia can form from purely physical processes. Just when I think you've said the stupidest thing ever, you keep talking. This, I'm afraid, is also an illusion. I'm not talking about the transformation of signals in the brain into mental content. I am talking about the actual subjective experience that people point to as mysterious. This subjective experience that people talk about is also something that has to develop in stages. Here is Yale neurologist Steve Novella on Intelligent Squared with Sean Carroll explaining how Capgras syndrome is an example of the lack of immediacy of our subjective experience. But let me just tell you about one very interesting neurological phenomenon called Capgras syndrome. This is a syndrome in which um, well, I'll give you, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. So uh, when you're looking at, let's say, the face of your wife or your spouse, um, what's falling on your retina is just shapes and shadows and colors and lines. But the, your brain has to construct that into an actual image. But then it also has to give meaning to the image. It has to tell you that these shapes are, in fact, a face. 
And then another part of the brain tells you, well, that's not just any face, that's the face I know well, that's the face of my spouse, the face of my wife. Now, assuming, however, you have feelings about your wife, let's assume that, then there's also a connection between that part of your brain that tells you that that face is your wife to the limbic system, that's the emotional part of your brain, and that connects your emotions, your feelings about your wife to that image. So when you see your wife, those feelings are connected to it. These are all circuits that are happening demonstrably in your brain. Now, in Capgras syndrome, that last connection is broken by a stroke, by damage, by something. So when someone sees their spouse, they recognize them as their spouse, but the feelings aren't there. So what do people conclude when this happens? Well, it's interesting, when people have brain damage, it affects how their brain constructs their image of reality. Because as, my, as, Kara, as Sean was saying, our, we're not, we don't have a tape recorder in our minds, in our brains. We are constructing reality, an image of reality, all the time. It's a very active process. Um, and when, you inter when that in process breaks down, then your construction of reality breaks down. So, and you usually don't have insight into that, especially initially, because we tend to assume that our experience is a real continuous experience. That's also something your brain constructs. So what do people conclude when they have this syndrome, that circuit is broken in their brain? They conclude that their wife, their spouse, must be an imposter. That's the only explanation that they can come up with. There's in fact a documented case of a husband who murdered his wife because he was convinced that an imposter had replaced his wife you know, with an exact, you know, it makes no sense, but that's the only way his brain could make sense of its broken construction of reality. Here's an actual case of someone who does have Kafka syndrome. Two years ago, David was involved in a terrible car accident while driving back to California from Mexico. There was a problem with the car, and I landed in the highway with my head first. Okay. Like this truck that is so For five weeks, David lay in a coma. Serious injuries led to the loss of his right arm. But to everyone's relief, when he came round, his mental capacities seemed to be intact. He was articulate, he was intelligent, not obviously psychotic or emotionally disturbed. Uh, he could read a newspaper. Everything seemed fine, except he had one profound delusion. He would look at his mother, and he would say, this woman, doctor, she looks exactly like my mother. But in fact, she's not my mother. She's an imposter. She's some other woman pretending to be my mother. The injury to the temporal lobes of David's brain had brought on a very rare condition called the Capgras delusion. The Capgras delusion is a tragic revelation of the vital role played by our emotions in the act of recognition. I was cooking dinner and he probably didn't like the food that night. Okay. And, and he said, you know, the lady who comes in the morning, she cooks much better than you. Okay. It's, a, it's that lady, I like that lady very much. <laughs> but the lady was me, of course, all the time. David was also convinced that his father was an imposter. He would say to his dad, you know, I'm sure you would like to meet this guy. I'm going to let you know this man because yeah, I'm sure you'll like it. He looks so much like you, but he drives better. He doesn't go so fast. I would like you to meet him because he looks a lot like you. After two months of this disturbing behavior, David's parents decided to seek help from Ramachandran, who they'd heard had an interest in such cases. But when you looked at the person who looked like your father, what was your feeling? Did it look like there's some other person who resembles your father? Is not really your father, something like that? Did exactly. Yeah. There's a difference of the fact that I know that that person happens not to be my father. Uh-huh. What was going on? Why was this gentleman there who, who looked like your father? If somebody who looks identical right. or very close to my father or my mother, the fact that that person it is not my father or my mother, right? Okay. I don't expect things from that person as I would expect from my parents. The associativity given to the experience is what is responsible for the subjectivity. Ask yourself, are you hearing words right now? The answer is no. I pointed this out 
in the first part of my series on materialism. As you are listening to my voice, the primary auditory cortex in the temporal lobe of your brain is processing the mechanical oscillations going into your ear from the audio device you're using to listen to this video. These waves are processed as sounds specifically corresponding to utterances made in the English language in such a way that you understand what I'm saying to you as I say it. However, the mechanical waves by which I convey the words I speak have no intrinsic meaning prior to their being understood by a hearer. They don't even exist as sound prior to their being understood by a hearer. The subjective experience of hearing these sounds is comprehending them as words that are a part of the English language in such a way that you understand what I'm saying to you as I say it almost immediately. But one must remember that it is not immediate. If you take various parts of the brain out, you don't see that, you don't hear that, and you don't taste that. You don't taste anything in some cases. There are multiple layers of processing that go into this phenomenon. So the immediacy of comprehending these words, just like the notion of an intrinsic persistent self, is also illusory. In the next video, I'll discuss a concept known as the given, and I'll discuss the degrees of givenness of particular subjective qualitative percepts. Stay tuned.